Hafidades and Talawani Sidzuas. The time right now is 1.07 p.m. and I would like to call this informational hearing by the Committee on Regional Affairs and the Guam Buildup back to order. We have with us uh, for our fourth and final panel representatives from the Joint Region Marianas. I will now recognize Captain Steve Stasek from NAFAC to introduce yourself, your title, and also introduce those presenting with you today. And once we get through the introductions, you may begin your presentation. Please proceed. Good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon, Captain Steve Stasek, Commanding Officer of Officer in Charge of Construction, Marine Corps Marianas. I'll be giving a construction overview, and then Al Borja will be providing the mitigation brief. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll start with the um, construction overview. So slide two, um, currently managing construction at several locations around the island. Um, yeah, there you go, that slide. Uh, slide provides a summary of each location. Follow on slides will provide more details on, for each location. So on this slide, the aviation support facilities are being constructed on Anderson Air Force Base on the north ramp of the airfield. Also on Anderson, we're constructing 178 three and four bedroom family housing units. On Naval Base Guam, we're constructing a sea embark facility as well as a new medical dental clinic. And we're also constructing two training facilities, the live fire training complex on Anderson Northwest Field and an urban combat training complex on Anderson South. And of course, we're constructing the 563 acre cantonment Camp Blas. That's where a majority of the construction effort will be shifting to in the next few years. Next slide. Okay, so I've se several of the other speakers today have already alluded to this. So uh, this is the sand chart reflects the projected construction work in place for the program. As you can see, we're, we'll be reaching peak of construction in fiscal year 23 through 25, with over a billion dollars of construction being executed in those years. In FY21 through FY22 to date, NAFEC has awarded 30 projects worth approximately $1.8 billion. In FY23, we're planning to award approximately another $1 billion in construction contracts. With the projects awarded to date and the progress of construction, I'm very confident in the projections that are reflected on this slide. Next slide. Okay, so going to all the, um, all the locations, start with Camp Laws. So we had the original J001B project that was contracted to clear and grade the 563-acre containment area. Part of the contract was also to remove all unexploded ordnance down to four feet. It also installed all required utilities, including communication infrastructure, sewer, water, and electrical supply, and it's constructing all the roads and sidewalks. Um, that project is wrapping up, and now we're going vertical. So the aerial, slide on, or the aerial on this slide is actually from February, and a lot of work's been completed since then. All the roads and sidewalks are in, all utilities are being wrapped up, and we have 30 vertical projects going, which are listed on this slide also. Uh, the projects that are currently underway were prioritized for award because they include the key facilities that are needed to relocate marine forces, and they include warehousing, berthing, fuel station, admin facilities, and other key base support facilities. Uh, the J031033 six-story barracks are what you can see from Route 3. Uh, there's, there's six stories. Uh, the roof's going on the first one of them. Uh, there's going to be eight total of those, and there's also going to be three five-story officer barracks. Uh, the J011 base admin facility is also visible from the road. It's a three-story building that's going to house the um, Camp Plaza administrative offices. And then the front gate is also being constructed, and you can see the front gate canopy going up and the visitor center constructed from the road. Many of the recently awarded projects are also coming out of the ground, so over the next year, Camp Laws will really start looking like a base. Next slide. Okay, so while the horizontal work was going on for Camp Laws, uh, we are focused on construction in other areas, North Ramp being one of those. So for North Ramp, aviation facilities were much further along with nine projects complete, including the two main hangars. Also, we also have three projects wrapping up in the new, next few months, and those include the mouse facility, the corrosion control facility, and the dining facility. The magazines and aviation admin facility were recently awards and have just started construction and are the last two major projects associated with the North Ramp. Both are scheduled to be complete in 2024. Next slide. 
Okay, construction on Naval Base is also far along with five projects complete. The medical dental facility will be complete in the next few months also, and we're projecting an FY23 award for the Opera Embark facility, which is designed to be a staging area to support Marine Corps offloads and unloads. Next slide. Okay, we have two projects for the live fire training complex. P715 constructed four live fire ranges to include a rifle range, pistol range, modified record range, and non-standard small arms range. This project's 99% complete, and we're just working a few minor project closeout issues. P735 is the machine gun range. You could see a rendering of that on the slide on, on the upper left. Um, it was awarded last September. Construction has started on that range, and completion date is expected to be in 2024. Next slide. And lastly, lastly, we have the Urban Combat, Combat Training Complex on Anderson South. This project was awarded in January 2019. It includes a state-of-the-art urban training area that took an old housing area and incorporated it into the training facility. We also constructed several mock-up facilities to include a hotel, municipal building, office building, bank, church, embassy, courthouse, school, and gas station. These mock-up facilities are constructed among the housing units to simulate a city environment for training. The site also has a shoot house, grenade range, breacher facility, and combat vehicle operators course. The project's been progressing well, and it's going to be completed October of this year. Next slide. That concludes my update, and I thank you for your time. I turn it over to Al. Hi, good afternoon. My name again is Al Albert Borja. I am the NAFAC Marianas Environmental Director supporting Marine Corps Base Camp Laws. I'm here today to provide a uh, brief uh, mitigation status update for the Marine Corps relocation uh, per our 2015 record of decision. Um, if we can have the slides, please, loaded. So our key commitments are grouped together into three, I would say, basic, um, basic tenets, uh, environmental protection, natural resource, conservation and cultural resource preservation. So for these, uh, under the, these three commitments, um, we have about 100, more than 140 different commitments that the Department of the Navy has lived up to. And we continue to um, exert our uh, diligence and our day-to-day -day efforts on meeting those commitments. Um, next slide, please. Uh, under the environmental protection highlights, uh, we have wellhead protection, stormwater management, waste management, and range monitoring wells. Uh, these four are uh, just highlights of what we have thus far of um, basically meeting our um, stated commitment of um, treating Guam uh, as if it's our home. Um, next slide, please. Under wellhead protection, uh, we have uh, different activities that we have either planned for or are implementing at this point. Um, in terms of protecting well heads, which are our uh, drinking water source, uh, in, in the northern Guam aquifer, uh, we, we are looking at the um, uh, siting of high-risk activities uh, in relation to drinking water sources. So uh, basically, um, our stated intention has been to site these types of activities as far away from wellheads as possible. I know in, uh, throughout the uh, you know, history of Guam, we, we, primarily in the civilian sector, we have uh, areas where uh, there, there could be conflicts with drinking water sources. So using those lessons learned uh, as we uh, implemented the plants for the buildup, we wanted to respect uh, uh, the 1,000 foot wellhead protection areas. And so uh, working with Guam EPA, uh, we've, we've asked, um, we've, met, we've met them before we even did designs. We wanted to discuss uh, best management practices and uh, site considerations whereby we can um, uh, reduce, uh, reduce the potential for uh, issues uh, as it pertains to um, drinking water wells. So all of our uh, designs that are developed by our construction contractors are, are reviewed by Guam EPA, and we've sought approval as part of the design review process under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And um, these, uh, the development that currently is uh, uh, happening is uh, no accident. Um, it's taken many years um, 
starting in 2013, 2014 timeframe, meeting with Guam EPA, meeting with our contractors. So all the fruits of our labor uh, over those years have resulted in um, more appropriate siting of um, you know, uh, things like gas stations, sewage lift stations. Those are outside the 1,000-foot one, 1, wellhead protection areas. Uh, we also follow our UFC uh, un, un, uh, Unified Facilities criteria uh, for um, stormwater design, meaning that we uh, design our uh, stormwater to be um, protective of wellhead protection areas. We have water quality uh, best management practices that filter and remove pollutants from um, areas like parking lots, and we make sure that we meet our stated goal of um, uh, uh, um, addressing the first flush, as we call it, uh, of stormwater that reaches those uh, infiltration basins that are within the development footprint. Um, we also cited our ranges away from drinking water sources. So in this particular slide, if you look at the bottom, uh, bottom right-hand side, um, there's the live fire training range, kind of in an orange color. We have an arrow, a double-sided arrow, uh, pointing to the wells that are in the geographic vicinity but are more than two miles away. So that's no accident. We uh, looked at we looked at the uh, possible siting of uh, different alternatives for training ranges, and we respected the 1,000-foot uh, wellhead protection in air area, and in this particular case, it's uh, even exceeded, exceeded that criteria. Um, and if you look at the general direction of groundwater flow, um, the, well, the, the water that the wells are extracting are not influenced by the, the water that is, um, uh, that is, that is uh, within the vicinity of the live fire training range complex. So those types of considerations, we worked out with Guam EPA, our other partners on the island. They have what's called the water advisory group and we received a lot of in, uh, input throughout, um, throughout the years uh, developing our plans, uh, even during the NEPA planning process and even during the project design process. So, you know, m many thanks to those uh, they're, they're too numerous to mention, but a lot of local experts that have helped us throughout the way. Um, last point here is the hand grenade range. Um, you know, it is, it is not part of the live fire training range complex at Northwest Field, but it is located uh, in the Marbo area, in the Anderson South area. Um, and even, uh, even that is treated under the same consideration, citing it away from uh, drinking water wells. Um, and the, um, the residue uh, from hand grenades of concern, um, there, there are many ways of removing um, that particular uh, group of um, explosives, um, and th either through sun exposure or keeping pH elevated um, around 11.5 pH. Um, and all of this is happening within a lined sand, uh, lined sand bed. So um, we have many, uh, many tools at our disposal to address any potential concerns at the ranges, and um, we have more uh, studies that we need to perform uh, prior to and during the early years of operation uh, that are part of our day-to-day um, -day management of those ranges. So more, more to follow on that, but um, you know, as part of our permitting process, uh, we, we are committed to Guam EPA working with them uh, on developing uh, evaluation tools as well as um, proper methods for controlling munitions constituents on the, on the range. Next slide, please. Um, further on stormwater management, uh, we, we did talk about the wellhead protection aspect of it, but overall, the, you know, we are trying to look at the natural flow path of stormwater on site. We're, we're not trying to concentrate or channelize flow uh, that could potentially impact a, a resource that is off base or you know, further away from the main base. So um, we, we did enlist the help of experts, local experts, uh, in performing uh, hydrogeological assessments, as we call it, basically looking at the, um, uh, the topography of the site and seeing where the current stormwater um, ponds, uh, and uh, looking at that, designing the best way to um, uh, preserve the flow paths that are currently existing. Uh, while still controlling uh, new stormwater that is uh, being um, uh, sheet flowed on top of, let's say, the ranges or parking lots and those types of features on the basis. If you look at the pictures on the slide, 
uh, you'll see the um, uh, on the bottom on the bottom left side you'll see like a gray picture there that's the natural karst topography that's found at the live fire training range complex uh, they did digital elevation models to find out where stormwater would be flowing um, and you know a lot of really you know good expert feedback came into uh, providing recommendations on how to properly manage and detain stormwater, treat it, and then um, infiltrate it for disposal. Uh, likewise, on the bottom right, uh, you'll see a multicolored uh, main cantonment there. Uh, the colors are the, um, uh, the, the basins, as they call it, that drain into regional uh, uh, detention, detention features. Um, and you'll see that, for example, blue, drains into that detention feature on the northwest uh, corner, uh, and on and on. Um, so all of this is planned. We don't, uh, as, it, you know, as, as the engineers design these stormwater uh, flow patterns, they want to make sure that they are handled appropriately, that they treat it for water quality as fo uh, and also for flood control. So I'm, you know, I'm always, um, uh, you know, as a non-engineer, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I respect every, every expert that brings their discipline into the development of uh, plans for the buildup. So I, I want to recognize that their work has gone into meeting uh, stormwater, stormwater criteria that's um, promulgated by Guam EPA and um, utilized by experts throughout the island. Um, I think that's. Uh, I, I also want to point out. I, I you know, I, I don't want to forget. Uh, you know, as when we build when we build these uh, BMPs, best management uh, practices for stormwater. Um, there's a multi-tier um, evaluation of whether they're done properly whether during construction and also post-construction. I want to point out that our contractors are responsible for quality control. So th that means they have to inspect their site on a weekly basis. The government comes in on another layer of control and uh, make sure that these inspections are done and that the, um, uh, you know, the stormwater uh, protection features are in place, uh, for example, silt fences, temporary detention basins, all of that comes into, um, comes into the picture to make sure that all of our stormwater impacts are contained within the site, treated within the site, and we're not um, you know, creating um, negative impacts to our, either our neighbors or to adjacent projects. So we, we place a lot of attention into making sure that uh, we've met local requirements, which are typically more stringent than federal requirements. Uh, next slide. Um, as far as waste management is concerned, uh, we, we do uh, put a focus on retaining and reusing most of our uh, waste material on site, particularly plant material, soil material, and, and other types of uh, fill that we generate during construction. Uh, we have a goal of 100% uh, util reutilization of compost on site, and uh, we balance our construction site so that we don't place additional pressure on local quarries. So most of the cut and fill that they do on site, cut means to excavate, and fill means to uh, put, place material back onto an area. So depending on the needs of a construction site, you know, uh, it, it could be you, you have a net, you know, net excavation uh, amount that you'll need to import more material into the construction project. But for the main cantonment, I think they've they've achieved almost like a, um, a net zero impact on uh, additional fill material, unless, of course, they have specialized needs for uh, engineered fill for, um, you know, foundations and other things that uh, are required for structural purposes. Um, and also our compost operations, um, we want to highlight that this is the largest composting operation on island. Our, our combined output has been uh, approximately 300,000 cubic yards of plant material that has gone through managed composting. Managed composting is not just stockpiling, uh, you know, plant material. It has to be uh, brought up uh, to a certain temperature so that you control pests and other uh, breeding of invasive species like coconut rhinoceros beetle. Uh, management also includes covering uh, certain um, uh, soils, uh, I mean, compost stockpiles with netting so that CRB does not infiltrate the pile or leave the pile. Uh, and create a, um, a problem for invasive species breeding. Um, and you know, all these lessons learned that we've uh, you know, gathered from managing these types of operations 
We are freely sharing with Guam EPA and other local solid waste management officials. We've done multiple visits with Guam EPA, CNMI EPA, as well as other solid waste management officials uh, uh, from the state side, uh, multiple different states. So, you know, as far as how we've managed this, this operation, I would say that very confident that um, we've managed it per our specifications. We're generating material that we are reutilizing on site. And as we progress with construction, we will find further use in terms of final landscaping as well as for forest enhancement project. So uh, very proud of the work that we're doing with our uh, um, re re -utiliz uh, re utilizing our compost material for, um, for future projects. Next slide, please. So for monitoring wells within our projects, this is a commitment from the uh, 2015 record of decision. Uh, two wells uh, are associated with our uh, live fire training range complex at Northwest Field uh, for the uh, what we call the uh, known distance ranges, so two wells there. And then for the multi-purpose machine gun range, that's another two wells, so total, total of four wells. Um, so the, the wells that are associated with the P715 project, the known distance ranges project, are completed. Uh, it's just awaiting government turnover. Uh, we still have to collect um, groundwater and soil samples. Um, so as far as um, having that information for future, uh, future studies, uh, we will get that from the construction projects. Uh, the multi-purpose machine gun range is, is still early in the construction process. So as, as those wells get um, installed and uh, more, more samples are collected from the wells as well as the soil in the general vicinity, all that information will help inform the baseline for um, the, the soil and groundwater condition at the live fire training range complex. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, let me put my, sorry, I put my cell on silent. Uh, for the um, existing, uh, existing information, we've, we've done our, some, uh, uh, our analysis under the National Environmental Protection Act in terms of uh, our concern with lead metal, which is the primary constituent of concern uh, at the firing ranges. Um, in, in, our, in our review of the information, the literature, uh, the Guam PA BPs that have been approved for use at the ranges have good uh, lead removal capacity. Um, so we, we believe that the lead that is generated at the range will strongly adsorb to the limestone uh, foot, you know, the limestone uh, structure of the range itself, and we believe that it will not, um, that we do not anticipate that it will leave the range. However, these monitoring wells are a precaution that is, um, that is committed to by the Navy to ensure that Whatever, um, whatever studies or evaluation are performed in the future, we have the capability of looking into the groundwater condition um, either during operations or even well past when the range, um, you know, when the range needs to be, um, you know, it has exceeded its, its lifespan. So those, those wells will come in um, useful uh, either during operations and post operations. Um, we are collecting our uh, baseline soil and groundwater samples over wet and dry season. Again, the P715 contractor um, still needs to complete that. Um, they, so wet and dry season mean that uh, throughout this calendar year, we will be obtaining those uh, samples. Uh, more to follow with, the, again, with the operational uh, range environmental studies. Uh, we've committed to Guam EPA to share that information as we develop it. And uh, it is actually part of our permit conditions that were issued by Guam EPA. So there, there will be partnership with Guam EPA as, as we've always done within this program. And uh, we will work with the experts to make sure that we have the appropriate plans in place uh, to support the operation of the range. Uh, last point here is that the hand grenade range already has monitoring wells in the vicinity. So uh, no, no construction of wells were associated with that range. Next slide, please. Uh, for our highlights for natural resource conservation, I uh, wanted to focus on threatened and endangered species, translocation and propagation, uh, forest enhancement, um, designation of conservation lands, and our biomonitors. Uh, we believe that healthy natural resources sustain our military 
readiness and support the military mission. For threats and endangered species translocation and propagation, we have met and exceeded our survival criteria per our regulatory uh, agreements with Fish and Wildlife Service. That, that is 50% survival in many cases. Uh, we've established a 20, 000, approximately 20,000 square foot Camp Laws nursery uh, that will help establish um, a threat to endangered species for use in our forest enhancement sites. Uh, that is already reaching capacity and we probably have to expand more to fulfill our forest enhancement requirements. Um, our nursery operations also support construction, uh, construction activity by helping recover cycads. Um, this is Cycas micronesica. I have a picture, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, so in, in the picture over there, you'll see uh, Cycas on the far, the far right. Uh, this is just one example of one of the uh, threats and endangered species that we, um, that we take, take care of as far as uh, construction. We have to propagate uh, at least uh, to 50% survival uh, this, this particular plant species. Um, and then we also have a long-term partnership with UOG uh, to continue the, um, continue the co uh, conservation of our mature Cerianthes nelsoni tree that will be within the live fire training range complex. We have appropriate distances from construction to make sure that it is not affected by uh, construction or operations. Um, and as part of our commitments, we also have to propagate the things uh, of this, uh, from the mature mother tree um, in our Camp Laws Forest Enhancement Sites. Um, on the bottom picture there, you'll see some boulders uh, that were installed for the propagation of uh, butterfly host plants, uh, particularly the eight-spot butterfly. Uh, this, uh, this area that this boulder was, these uh, set of boulders were constructed within are undergoing um, uh, pig and deer eradication. The primary problem with these host plants is that they are browsed upon by deer. And so as we eradicate uh, these, um, these invasive animals on the range, uh, we will be able to outplant our butterfly host plants and create a habitat for, uh, for the eight-spot butterfly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for forest enhancement, we've uh, eradicated pig and deer within a 700-acre area. If you look at the bottom right picture there, it's that red, that red shape uh, above the uh, uh, main cantonment, uh, the Camp Laws main cantonment. Uh, this 700-acre area is uh, surrounded by uh, what we call ungulate fences. Um, so basically, it's an exclusion fence or barrier that prevents uh, any uh, pig or deer that are outside of that area from going inside. Uh, the inside of this area has already been eradicated. Um, yeah, the pig and deer have been controlled to the point where they will no longer uh, um, serve as a problem for our outplanting activities. The problem with forest enhancement, obviously, is when you put out new seedlings out there, they could be browsed upon by the pig and deer. So by eradicating, uh, uh, we, we don't have any more issues with uh, raising plants that are either native, uh, that are both native or threatened or endangered. So uh, we're looking to continue that work. We're, re we're right now at, we're at 700 acres. We need 1,000 acres to fully meet our commitment. So, uh, but I, I believe we're we're um, we're on a solid track there to accomplish our goals. Um, and and you know, uh, in, more importantly, a lot of our implementation plans are generated with the help of uh, academia at the University of Guam. Um, so we've, we have a cooperative agreement that we're working through, make sure that um, we get community feedback and, and expert feedback on our uh, implementation steps for forest enhancement. Um, I think our major challenges moving forward would be irrigation and also how to um, you know, break, break these, uh, uh, this larger area into outplanting blocks. So, we're soliciting input and expert advice, and I'm uh, very confident that we'll work through those through those challenges over the years. This is a long-term uh, this is a long-term commitment for the in support of the buildup. Um, just some pictures there of the ungulate fence uh, in the center, uh, bottom center. Uh, you'll see that it uh, has a plastic mesh uh, attached to metal, uh, like a metal um, metal post, and then there's livestock panels at the bottom of it. And then on the bottom, uh, bottom left-hand side, you'll see the 
uh, hunting dogs that, uh, we, that are um, hired out essentially to help us control the pig and deer on site and uh, obviously the sharpshooters that are participating in that activity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as far as new conservation lands, um, most, some of you have already probably heard about the Guam Micronesia Kingfisher Memorandum of Agreement. Uh, Joint Region Marianas uh, effectively has to protect 5,234 acres of habitat that, um, that is um, helpful for the recovery of the kingfisher and other species. Uh, this mitigation ratio was four to one, so for every acre of um, habitat affected by the buildup, four acres had to be set aside. So uh, as you can see, it covers both uh, Marine Corps Base Camp laws, that green, that green solid overlay that you see on the bottom right um, extends beyond Marine Corps Base Camp laws and Anderson Air Force Base um, and wraps around all the way to the eastern side of um, the installation at Anderson Air Force Base and to the west of uh, Marine Corps Base Camp laws. It's an extensive amount of conservation area and uh, we're actually, uh, it's helping to anchor a lot of our conservation projects knowing that these, um, this, this, uh, these lands that have been set aside will uh, be protected in perpetuity. Um, to the bottom left, you'll see the ungulate control area for the live fire training range complex. It's about 300, more than 300 acres of forest that has been also uh, similarly um, fenced in uh, with pig and deer barrier to make sure that once we've completed eradication in that area, uh, that no more pig and deer uh, will, will go into that area to uh, disturb any uh, forest enhancement or outplanting activities. So these are just uh, examples of large-scale, landscape-scale um, conservation uh, areas that we will be focusing on as, as the uh, program progresses. Next slide, please. So we also have um, biomonitors that um, are, are on the ground um, uh, staff that help us with inspections of uh, making sure that our commitments are carried out um, they are deployed in areas where there's high levels of vegetation clearing. Um, you know, they help ensure that our projects remain within their project limits and that cargoes and vehicles are inspected for cleanliness. We don't want any hitchhikers on cargo or vehicles that enter, our project, enter and exit our project sites. Um, they also make sure that uh, uh, threatened and endangered species checks, for example, bat surveys are done prior to vegetation clearing. Um, per our biological opinion with Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we're also proud to say that the NAVFAC and UOG Biomonitor team, we both have in-house and uh, cooperator support are all residents of Guam. Uh, so we are helping with the green economy. Uh, Biomonitors support uh, the turnover of cultural timber to the Department of Chamorro Affairs, um, making sure that it is um, that it's accounted for and staged properly on Gov Guam, um, Gov Guam places uh, uh, of you know, Gulf Guam jurisdiction. This is primarily at the Guam Raceway. And um, we also sponsor visits um, and collection of culturally important plants and seeds uh, for herbalists and other traditional practitioners. Next slide, please. So our next uh, highlight would be our cultural resource preservation for archeological monitoring, uh, archeological data recovery, preservation in place and um, a highlight on the Saban and Fadang Monument in Crip. Um, again, uh, you know, our cultural resource stewardship begins with respecting um, the, the culture and, and also the, the host community that uh, benefits from these resources. Next slide, please. So for archeological monitoring, um, we, we did agree with the SHPO to monitor our big buildup projects. Uh, this has led to discoveries of uh, approximately 40, 40, uh, 40 plus archeological areas. Um, and these, these areas are primarily composed of um, cooking pits, pottery, stone tools, um, basically evidence of the prehistoric use of the forest for, um, for survival, obviously. Um, and and the, the, the archeological boundaries, I think there's a, there's a misconception uh, out in, in the public when they see our you know, our investigation boundaries. These are essentially like big areas where there's multiple discrete features within that bigger boundary, but they're grouped because, you know, they're within vicinity of each other, but the, the features or the artifacts that are collected 
are really just very small points within this bigger boundary. So the, the boundary itself is, has a lot of, you know, has a lot of um, uh, gaps, as, well, as I call them, where there is no um, uh, you know, ar archaeological feature or artifact. Um, I just want to point that out because uh, there, there are some people who ask me, why, why is this area so big? You know, but but I, I mentioned to them that the archaeological feature itself or the artifact found is a very small object or a very small feature within the landscape. Um, and sometimes as our archaeological investigations proceed, those boundaries uh, of investigation uh, become smaller uh, due to ruling out certain areas because they do not support uh, you know, uh, that you know, either an artifact or um, you know, some feature is, is truly uh, an archaeological feature. Sometimes it's a modern, a modern burn on the surface. Uh, you know, somebody uh, set, a, set a fire in, uh, on the surface. Um, so these types of concepts, it's, it's um, hard, hard to um, communicate, but at, at the end of the day, you know, the basic message is you know, these uh, resources that we are um, uh, finding in, in the landscape are being adequately studied. We're, do we're doing careful excavation to document those features and make sure that the story that they contain are actually, um, you know, are, are used beneficially um, by future generations to help um, understand and appreciate the Chamorro culture. Um, and we believe that the amount of information that we actually have collected will change the understanding of the uh, ancient Chamorro use of the Guam's prehistoric northern plateau. Um, and we are in development of many uh, public outreach materials, um, and we, we have our parties under the 2011 PA that we are cooperating with, making sure that their input is received and factored into some of these uh, working products. So a lot, a lot, of, um, a lot, of, a lot of information uh, will be forthcoming uh, that will be shared with the public and has been shared with the public. Um, I think that's it for archaeological monitoring. Next, next slide, please. Archaeological data recovery. Uh, when sites cannot be avoided, uh, agreements allow for us to uh, do data recovery. And that's basically careful excavations to retrieve uh, information and artifacts that um, help inform what a archaeological site is. Uh, all of these artifacts that we collect and, uh, and analyze and clean will go to the Guam Cultural Repository. You might have heard from Ms. Vera Tapasna on the update on that. Um, we also have public information booklets that we develop using that information that we just gained um, from analyzing our archaeological sites. Um, these will be distributed to the public and have been distributed to the public. Uh, we also do updates to the Guam Synthesis, which is a SHPO work product that we are uh, helping develop. Um, it is a review of the up-to-date um, knowledge of um, archaeology on Guam, and all the results that uh, we collect from our archaeological work will go into this synthesis. Um, we are also uh, developing all sorts of methods and standard operating practices with the SHPO. Uh, in particular, I want to highlight here um, recovery of uh, human skeletal remains that are found during construction. We've set a, um, a process by which we um, uh, extend our investigations outside from, for example, you know, we find um, a small piece of bone in a particular area. We extend 25 square meters around that single piece of bone, you know, so that's developed in cooperation with the SHPO and has helped us um, keep intact uh, burials that uh, we've, we've, um, you know, we've discovered as part of uh, human remains uh, investigations. Um, uh, the last point I want to bring up here is that you know, the scale of investigations that we've conducted for the Guam buildup is a rare window uh, in time. That's, that's the study of archaeology. You're looking at past, um, past history uh, through through uh, the, the study of what has been left behind by those who have come before us. So given the scale of the Guam buildup, we are able to have a, a larger window into the past and are uh, helping uh, with greater understanding and appreciation of the culture and, and the heritage um, as a result. Next slide, please. Um, for, the most, for the most part, um, the overwhelming majority of cultural sites uh, that are 
within our um, planning footprints have been avoided. Uh, this is during the National Environmental Policy Act process. Uh, we've coordinated with the SHPO on our alternatives. So as a result of that, we've avoided many sites, particularly at uh, Naval Magazine. Uh, Naval Magazine, um, some folks may not know, was part of our uh, alternatives for the ranges. Um, there were a lot of sites in there. Uh, choosing uh, Northwest Field resulted in less impacts to pre-contact sites, important pre-contact sites at Naval Magazine. Um, and then as we progressed towards design uh, of projects, we were even further able to avoid um, um, you know, archaeological sites like rock shelters and artifact scatters uh, located at Northwest Field um, when we were designing the known, uh, the known distance rifle, rifle range, I'm sorry, the known, um, known distance ranges uh, under P715. Um, and all prehistoric burials that we have encountered thus far have been preserved, uh, preserved in place. Uh, for example, this abandoned Fadang and uh, Mog Fog burials have been preserved in place. So we are particularly proud uh, of our work with the SHPO on, on those particular burials. And um, uh, the pictures that you see here on the bottom uh, represent the, uh, uh, the, the, construction, uh, the completion of the construction of the uh, uh, Saban and Fadang Monument and Crypt. Um, so you'll see, see the uh, sense of scale there with the folks that are in the foreground. Um, basically, we have a large plaque uh, which provides interpretive um, you know, an, an interpretive explanation of what the Saban, the, of the significance of the Saban and Fadang area and, the, and obviously the ancestors that um, have, been, have been laid to rest there. Uh, we also have Lu songs that, are, um, that flank that, uh, that plaque. Uh, so we're particularly proud of that, um, demonstrating our respect for uh, the ancestral Chamorro and honoring, uh, honoring their legacy. Um, and so the design, as you can see there, kind of a reminiscent of a figure eight that was uh, and, you know, surrounded by landscaping and trees. Uh, that design was, um, you know, performed, um, you know, with, with the uh, Department of Chamorro Affairs and uh, sh uh, State Historic Preservation Officer uh, input. So we're particularly proud of that coordination. Next slide, please. So just, this is just a further highlight on our coordination prior to constructing the Saban and Fadang Monument in Crypt. Uh, we did cooperate with the governor in Guam Shippo for performing a ritual ceremony prior to the construction, which I understand is, uh, hasn't been done in, in Guam history. Typically, uh, ceremonies are performed at the completion of the burial, uh, burial monument. Um, oh, I, mentioned, oh, I also mentioned in here the coordination with Shippo and Department of Chamorro Affairs. Um, one aspect of this monument is that it, it is equipped with a crypt. So if we do have undetermined remains, um, that we cannot associate with, with either, uh, whether it's tomorrow or uh, pre or post war or pre or post contact. Uh, th these, these small, you know, small uh, size of your fingernail type of, um, you know, in terms of dimensions. Uh, we have a crypt whereby we will um, consolidate all that, all that uh, human remains that are, are, are under our protection and rebury them in accordance with Guam requirements for reburial. So that, that, is the, that is the intent for this crypt that we have uh, within the main cantonment. Okay. So that, that concludes my presentation uh, for the update on the uh, mitigation status for the 2015 record of decision and for the military relocation. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Bora. I do know that the senior military and political advisor of Joint Region, very honest, is here, Mr. Randy Sablan. Would you like? Do you have any comments and also introduce your other panel members here before I open for comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Speaker. Um, so first and foremost, on behalf of uh, Rear Admiral Ben Nicholson, we, we really appreciate the opportunity to come here and provide um, additional information uh, that is an ongoing effort through the years. I would note that um, the presentations that you see here, particularly the construction update, um, is very similar information that we use for the Civilian Military Coordinating Council um, that we periodically hold with the governor and, and her cabinet and other members of DOD. Um, so looking for some equity in, in continuously updating and providing information. And 
thank you for uh, the website that you have that really catalogs and collects this information. It's growing steadily. Um, I've looked through it and I think that, you know, it's very informative. It can be the basis for comparing the progress we've made over time. Um, questions can be asked from that set of information um, in addition to the most recent updates that we've just given. Um, very much appreciate that kind of input from the community and, and the legislature, anyone really, and uh, we'll diligently uh, develop responses to those. Um, I think that um, the team here, you know, Al, and, and we also have uh, uh, Colonel Bopp, Christopher Bopp from Marine Corps Base Camp Blas, um, OICC, uh, Captain Stasic, and really a cast of, of many other professionals um, do a lot of work day in and day out to make sure that we're in compliance with all of the conditions that were um, given to us through biological opinion consultations, those in the programmatic agreement, um, and then more generally those like from Guam EPA that are imposed on, on construction. It, it's a sizable job. Um, it is ongoing and I, I think they've, they've done a, a pretty good job to date. I, I tip my hat to them. Um, and then, you know, it's not, as Al said, it's not just the Navy and the Navy subject matter experts. We work with this community and the experts that are in the community, whether they be traditional practitioners, whether they be groundwater geologists from Weary, whether they be from the natural resources uh, offices, um, you know, programs at UOG. That collection of knowledge comes together to give us the most practical, reasonable, and in many cases, the most protective way forward as we build this military base. So hats off to all of our partners in the community too. They do a great job and I, I think, you know, they're passionate about their, their expertise and we feed off of that, that energy and it comes together really well. Um, I will make one other note before I, I pass it on to uh, um, Colonel Bopp and that is um, back in 2017, um, I looked through the presentation. I was part of a, a large and long um, round table that we had here in this very room. And in that presentation, we did talk about the uh, range uh, environmental evaluation process, the, the REVA process. So that's coming up very soon. We're putting the pieces together to put together um, the program that allows us to take care of the ranges so that they meet environmental standards, but also are always essentially continuously available to the Marines and other military members to practice their skills. Um, Al Borja has kindly agreed to go to the Northern Aquifer Working Group meeting that should happen in June timeframe. It's chaired by uh, Ms. Vanji Lujan up at GWA and is a collection of both DOD and academia and practitioners. And so that presentation will dive a little deeper into Riva, and I would like to uh, invite any member of the legislature, yourself included, ma'am, uh, to come and, and, and sit down and have a, a good conversation based on the presentation that will lay out how it is we take care and do uh, maintenance of our ranges, whether they be live fire or, or non-live fire ranges. So, at the risk of going on too long, I'd like to uh, give the floor, if you don't mind, to uh, Colonel Bob. Colonel. Good afternoon, Madam Vice Speaker. I just want to say thank you for having us here today. Uh, we have enjoyed working here on Guam with all of our partners to make sure that this is an integrated program, that we are taking care of uh, all the people here to meet the needs of our nation. And really the final point beyond what has been said already is that the pace of construction, everything that's happening here on Guam means that we are on track to meet the agreement between the government of the United States and the government of Japan uh, to start moving the Marines here in accordance with that agreement. Thank you. Do you have any remarks, sir? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much at this time. I will ask my vice chair on the build-up, uh, Senator Frank Plas, for comments. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. Thank you very much for that briefing and as far as the mitigation. I think there was a lot of information there that 
still need to digest, okay? Um, and I recognize that this is, continues to be an ongoing thing and this is, it's evolving, okay? Uh, I continue to appreciate, the, you know, the open dialogue. I hope that it continues. Um, you know, we've gone past the point of no return, actually. So, you know, let's, uh, we, now it's just more incumbent for us to be able to work uh, more closely together. Gentlemen, I, again, thank you for taking the time and coming and providing us the briefing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Vice Chair and Regional Affairs, Senator Mary Torres. Comments, please. Just want to extend a Dunklu Nesidus Maasi for your presence today. Whether you contributed to the presentation or not, your presence here was, is noted uh, and appreciated. There's certainly a lot that, that we do have to, as my, my colleague mentions, we have to digest. But I, I think the important thing here is where, where it is presented, we have now the opportunity to as a committee, uh, look at it and, and extend any further questions, which um, we know that you will be more than anxious to address. Because it, going forward, it, it's, it's really a balance between the good of the nation, national security, but most importantly, the, the good of the, the island and the community that hosts you here. Um, and so we just want to thank you again for, your, for the information. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Um, Senator Paris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, it was, it's actually quite hard to li listen to the presentation considering um, the mitigations fall very short of what, um, what we have and what we need to protect. Um, you know, as part of the Chamorro people, you know, we've been on, on this island for over 3,000 years and to see our cultural sites being erased from our, our, our view and then seeing also these, these forests that have um, took millennia to develop being raised. Uh, and then also having to hear that, um, you know, there's monitoring wells because potential contamination of our, of our water resources. And this is the resource that we, we, um, we depend upon for living here on this island. And it's really hard to hear this, to see, you know, to, to, to hear this time and time and again of the destruction of our environment, the destruction of our cultural resources, and to have it present as if it's a good thing. You know, mitigation was a negotiation between two federal partners. It did not involve any local input. And, you know, this is the situation of being a, um, a colony of the United States. We don't have, we don't have a seat at the table. And, um, you know, you yourself mentioned this will fulfill an agreement between the US and Japan. Where was Guam in that consideration? Where was Guam in that decision-making um, seat? And it's unfortunate because we just had a previous presentation earlier, uh, Dr. Lum from the East-West Center, who said that in Hawaii, they brought the stakeholders together beyond the scoping meetings that we have been subjected to for over a decade here and they were able to really come to um, a dialogue. And I think that's what's really missing. That's what's been missing for so long. Um, you know, to have these decisions, even, you know, decisions that have huge impacts. And we will, we will see these impacts for generations. And we will be here, hopefully. But, you know, I think that, um, in the military, the U.S. military, they have over 700 installations or over 700 installations worldwide. You know, that's part of the, the strategy, right? The lily pad basing. Um, you know, Guam, this is, we can't, this is, we can't expend this. I mean, from the military perspective, we are expendable. Because you have 699 other installations where you can move in and out of. But this is the Tremor homeland. This is where we as a culture developed. So it's really hard to hear this, to hear these plans just go forward without any kind of um, you know, thought, consideration. It's a, it, and again, it's, a, it's according to the US framework of laws. It's not really to, it's, I don't see any accountability towards the people here. And I think we really have to recalibrate what these terms are and what does it mean to protect, right? Protect and honor. To me, honor is not about 
moving our burials from one site to another. It's about preserving it in place, even the context. You know, what does protect mean? You know, protect our, our water from being contaminated. You know, this goes for everybody, everybody who uses our resources here. As you saw in Hawaii, you know, the Red Hill contamination affected those in the military too as well. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's important that we really truly have a dialogue, you know, and just have this, um, you know, about what, you know, really truly listen to what the people are, are, are asking and demanding. And it's unfortunate that we don't have this dialogue in this, in this particular um, hearing today. I mean, I think there's so many questions that, that, that are here in this presentation. I think there, there are a lot of questions that are coming up from the presentation itself. And then what about the critical habitat, right? So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, there was a lawsuit by um, Center for Biological Diversity re requiring that there are habitats that have to be created for these 23 new listed species. So what is that? What is the follow through for that with the Department of Defense? And I think it's important that, you know, we need to protect our people here, starting from making sure our water is safe, our marine environment is safe. And I don't see enough of that, enough of those protections in this particular uh, presentation today or in the engagement that we've had in the past. So um, again, you know, I do wanna have this conversation to um, if we can follow up this with an actual dialogue to address these concerns that are still haven't been addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sabina. Senator Joanne Brown, comments please. I do appreciate uh, the presentation of information, certainly as mentioned by my colleague, Senator Perez. I mean, there's a lot of information provided and certainly I think we would have benefited more from a more direct engagement. Um, you know, submitting questions in silence and receiving responses in silence really don't allow for the level of transparency that I think is critically important for both sides, for the work and the mission that you're here to pursue and implement, and also for awareness in the community of what's exactly happening with regards to the buildup. You know, I recognize there's a bigger world picture that's going on out there and the reason why the buildup is happening on Guam. But I think we also recognize it's valuably important to also have a good neighbor relationship on island and with the residents that are here. I know many of you that are doing the work, certainly Mr. Borja and Mr. Randy Sablon, who I started working with at Guam EPA 32 years ago. You know, I have some comfort in the work and, and the pride that you expressed in what you're doing in your presentation. Uh, you're sort of caught in between the bigger political issues, obviously, that are here but to the ability of what we know and what is available in terms of environmental protection. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're doing all that you can to address that. But nevertheless, I hope we have another forum where there's more direct engagement and certainly that it will allow an opportunity for our public to have a greater insight uh, on the work that you're doing here and, and the implementation and the construction of the new base. And then also, uh, you know, what mitigation efforts are being put in place and what greater awareness. I think when we, we lift that shroud of silence and secrecy, um, you know, it opens a better opportunity for, for awareness and understanding on both sides of the aisle. Granted, there is a bigger world picture, and I think we're, we're seeing right now what's happening in the Ukraine and, and what's happening to other parts of the world in this, this region, uh, why we need to address defense of our island and of our community and certainly of, our, of the United States of America, which I know is a very important mission, most critical mission that's here. Uh, but as we get down to the most basic issues just here on Guam, um, I think more open dialogue and engagement and the opportunity to ask questions and hear your responses to that, uh, I think would be a more fruitful dialogue. But thank you for coming this afternoon and speaking with us. Thank you very much, Senator Brown. I, I, I just want to say, um, regardless of what the perspective of any of my colleagues on this panel may feel, I can sense the passion in... Um, Senator uh, Sabina's uh, statements. And one thing I will agree on is that we need, we need to engage in a better ob objective dialogue. And once I compile the questions, I will send them over to you, 
Mr. Randy and hope that for a swift response and based on the responses we get and the commitment that I've received from uh, Admiral Nicholson, I think that uh, we may need to do greater engagement on the important topics like these. And this is not the end, but hopefully the first of many. And I do want to take the time to, to um, thank you, uh, Captain Stasek and Mr. Bora, uh, for being here. And again, I will note for the record that uh, I will uh, be compiling the questions from my colleagues uh, and uh, we hope to get a timely response. And with that being said, uh, I do want to take the time to thank my colleagues who literally took the time to stay here for all the four panels. And um, I want to continue this collaboration moving forward. And with that being said, I, I will note to the listening audience that uh, if there are any uh, one who wishes to present any questions from today's uh, presentation or has questions regarding the buildup, uh, please do not hesitate to send your increase or your questions to me either by email at Senator Tina Munya Barnes at guamlegislature.org or you can even hand deliver it to my office at 163 Chalan Santo Papa Hagatnya Guam 96910. With that being said, I will call this uh, informational briefing and presentation this afternoon. I will call it adjourned, and it is now 2.10 in the afternoon. Sijos Masi and Sijos Benedici for taking the time. Sign